I've heard people say that uh, some people would rather die than come up here and talk. <laughs> it has the opposite effect on me. I just, I just thrive on being up front and not for the attention so much. It's just I got lots of energy, and so I want to get that energy out. <laughs> so anyway, thank you, everybody, for all your offering. It's always good to see the young people up doing things as well. Get them, get them started when they're young. I don't think too many of us in this room could probably say that you have ever been held in bondage. I think most people would probably say, no, the, the 13th Amendment to the United States abolished that kind of bondage, slavery, as an institution in this country a long time ago. But of course, as we know, there's, there's other types of, of bondage. Uh, my father and my grandfather and my great-grandfather and even one of my brothers all of them were held in bondage by a thing called alcohol. And every one of them, except I don't know about my great-grandfather, but I know the rest of them, all died as a result of their addiction to things like alcohol and tobacco. And, and so things can hold us in bondage for sure, but I think one of the things you gotta look at is that if something's holding you in bondage, there's a root cause, all right? There's, there's, there, we, we do root cause analysis in, in my line of work, and we sit down and we analyze things until we get to the root of the problem. And you've heard that expression before. Years ago, I was a, a food service director in a, a uh, retirement center down in Portland, Oregon. And I was, had gone to the main office one day, and I went in there and sat down. And the desk, the chair I was sitting at, the, uh, behind the desk I was at, it was kind of off in the corner, so if you walked into the office, you couldn't see me. And so the, the, this, this uh, lady comes in, one of the people that lived there, and her name was Maria, and she shuffled in there, and she could see the receptionist right in front of her, and so she began to basically unload on her about how horrible the food service program was at the facility. And I'll tell you what, this lady complained about everything. There was nothing I can't remember that she left off the table in terms of what she complained about. And she didn't see me sitting over in the corner, of course, and so uh, the receptionist, you know, she looked over my way and she finally told Marie, she said, Marie, she said, uh, you might want to talk to that fellow sitting right there. So I invited her to come over and sit down at the chair across from the desk I was at, and I said to her, Marie, what's, what's going on? What's bothering you today? And so she went and bite back into everything that she had been complaining about, and I said, Marie, I said, tell me what it is that's really bothering you. And so she, you know, found some other things that she complained about and kind of narrowed it down. And I finally, I said to her, I said, you know, Marie, I said, something happened here. There's something, you know, really that's bothering you right at the root of all of this. And what do you think it is? And she told me her problem was, and it ruined everything else in her experience, was that somebody hadn't brought her a glass of water. And that was it. This is what she was upset about. And we all understand this, right? You know, you have that friend, you have that friend who, who is the most wonderful person in the world despite all their faults until they do something to upset you. And then everything about them becomes a problem. And you recognize those problems, but you didn't have that problem before, right? There's always a root problem to what's going on. And I want you to listen to this scripture out of John 8. It's Jesus and he's talking to people as he always does, and there's people listening, and, and there's people, of course, that are listening for, for a variety of reasons, and we'll hear that in this story. But Jesus says in John chapter 8, starting with verse 32, listen to what he says. And you've heard this scripture before. You, and you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, I want you to know, that's the basis of what we're talking about today. We're going to expand on that. But that's the basis of what we're talking about. But there were some people there that took exception to what Jesus was saying. And listen to what they said. And this was, the, of course, the, uh, the Pharisees. They didn't want to hear what Jesus had to say. I, they felt insulted by the things that he said. And they took exception to it. And they said, we are Abraham's seed. And we were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou that you shall be made free? And see, they were looking at things from a completely different perspective. And Jesus, of course, was talking about a spiritual perspective here, but they didn't pick up on that. So Jesus expands on that a little bit more. And in verse 34, Jesus says, Verily I say unto you, in other words, truly, I'm speaking the truth to you, he said, whosoever commits sin 
is the servant of sin. Now, listen to what he says. He's going to build on what he said about the truth setting you free. He said, if the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, each one of us needs to look at that and say, okay, if we are held in bondage by sin, and this is what Jesus is talking about here, if we are held in bondage by sin, the only thing that's going to set us free is Jesus Christ. And we have to understand that this is the pure and simple gospel message. Don't complicate it. Don't complicate the gospel message because this is what Jesus is talking about. Now, I'm going to read you a scripture out of Isaiah. It's in 50 verse 1, and I want you to listen to this because this is very interesting. <clears throat> and we're going to and remember this because we're going to talk about this again in a few minutes. I'm going to bring up another scripture out of Isaiah that's really a response to this. And so listen to what it says, Isaiah 50 verse 1. Thus says the Lord, behold, for your iniquities you have sold yourselves. Now, that doesn't just apply to Israel when Isaiah was talking. That's applying to you and I. We sell ourselves out to sin. But friends, the sins that we're talking about here are a symptom of a root problem. So now we're going to take it a step further, and we're going to move into Ephesians. And yeah, I am moving through this. Remember, when a guy gets up front and talks here, when a person gets up front and talks here, this is simply an outline. I hope you understand that. You know, if there's any way I could, I could really expand on something, we'd, we'd have to take all the sermons ever written, you know, and sit here and be here forever. So, so you take the information, right, and then you take it back, and then you see, well, I want you to prove whether or not what Ron said was true or not. That's what you really need to do. And every once in a while, I'll say something up here. It's rare. I'll, I'll say this. Every once in a while, I'll say something, and somebody will come to me and say, well, wait a minute, what about this? And uh, on, on one of those occasions, not too long ago, I had to go back and look at it, and I said, you know what? i got to concede. I actually did say something not quite the right way. So, so we got to be careful with that. But do your homework, and you'll find out whether I'm correct or not. Or better yet, you'll find out what the Bible says is correct or not. So here we go to Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to expand a little bit more on what Jesus was talking about. But this time, Paul is talking to us. And I want you to listen to what he says. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the lush, l flesh and of the mind. Now, I'm going to stop there for just a second, then we'll go back over this again. He's talking about living in a sinful state. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about that, that uh, uh, we have all had this point in our life where I think we can admit that we are sinners, but he's going to tell you what the problem is right behind it. So I'm going to read it again, and then I'll finish it. And listen to what he says. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. Listen to what he says right here. And we were by nature. There it is. We were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So what is this nature that he is referring to. Well, you have to say he's probably talking about the fallen nature. No, he's not probably. He is talking about it. He's talking about the fallen condition of mankind. Now, if you were to go back to the, uh, to the very beginning, to, to Genesis, and you would read the story of Adam and Eve, you would discover a couple of things. And one of them is, is that they were created with a spiritual nature. All right? That, that was the that was the, 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 the perfect nature that God gave them when they were created. But when they chose to sin, they received a fallen nature. You see, so you got two natures here. And I want you to remember this, all right, because we're going to get back to this in just a minute. So you have, here, you have here a spiritual nature, which they lost, and you have here a fallen nature, which they passed on to their children and their children and their children all the way down to you and I. So every one of us has a fallen nature, and it goes like this. The wages of sin is death, right, because that's the fallen nature, but the gift of God, the spiritual nature, is, is life eternal. So, so we look at this and we say, all right, so Paul's talking about these natures, all right, and we're going we're gonna to focus on these for just a, just a little bit here <clears throat> to understand that in the plan of redemption, in the plan of salvation, that God said, you know what, I'm going to give my son, and he is going to stand in your place, and you are going to be able to receive, as a free gift, a gift of grace, that spiritual nature again. So it's a restoration project, is really what it is. And everybody sitting here 
can take part in that. Now, that's something you got to remember as we walk through this today. So it's going to sound like I'm going to divert here a little bit, but I'm really not, and I'll show you why in just a minute. But we have to remember something that when Paul's talking about the law of God, he's intertwining this with the nature, all right, that human nature, that natural and that spiritual nature. So keep that in mind as well. All right, so we're going to move over to Romans, and we're going to spend quite a bit of time here in Romans right now. And in Romans 7, verses 14, we read this. Listen very carefully. For we know that the law is spiritual. So what law is he talking about there? We'd have to be talking about God's law. Because if it's spiritual, it's God's law. So we know that the law, God's law is spiritual, but I am carnal. So when he says I'm carnal, what's he talking about? Well, what he's saying is I profess to be something, but I'm something else. That's what he's saying. And that's no better than a fallen nature. I just want you to know that. If you call yourself a Christian, and yet you're not living that life, you're not, you're not experiencing, experiencing that restoration that Jesus wants in your life, if you do not have that spiritual nature, then you are in name only a Christian, and that's what Paul's referring to here. He says you are carnal, you are carnal. and if you are carnal, you're no better than fallen, all right? You're no better than natural, because that's what you are. That is the old man of sin that Paul is talking about here, all right? So, so, for we know that God's law is spiritual. We know that the law is spiritual. But I am carnal, sold under sin. And listen to what he says here. And the law holds me in bondage because I'm guilty. Now, last October, I remember I, I came and I preached you a, a sermon. You think I got a good memory, right? Actually, I went back and looked it up just, just yesterday to make sure that I had the right date. So in October, I was here and I was telling you, I preached on something, and this is the, the, the scripture I preached on. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. Now, we just read there in Romans 7, 14, that the law is holding me in bondage because I'm guilty, and I explained to you when I was here in October that the strength of sin is the law because the law holds me in bondage. The law teaches me that I am carnal. It teaches me that I have a fallen nature. By the commandments of God, it shows me what God's law is, and I have a choice here. It also shows me the penalty of sin. It shows me that the wages of sin is death. Remember, the sting of death is sin, right? And the strength of sin is the law. In other words, the law's strength comes from the fact that it's going to hold you in bondage until you get to that point where you are in that restored state of that spiritual nature. That's what it's referring to here. All right, so we are going to talk about some laws, all right? And, and I don't know if anybody really likes to hear laws. There's all kinds of laws, right? If you go drive down the road and blow through a red light and you get stopped and pulled over by a policeman, a police officer, then what did you do? You broke a law, right? So we have laws of the land. And we have laws of nature, right? We have, we have laws of physics. Uh, there's laws in chemistry and, and, and all of rules in geometry, all these things, all of which I did horrible in when I was in school. When I was in college, I took physics and chemistry and computer science. And, you know, those teachers were so happy when I left their class because I even had one teacher come up to me and say, you know, you ought to consider dropping this class because I was so bad at some of these classes I did. And, you know, I thought I was going in the right direction and doing the right thing, but it, physics and all that just wasn't my thing. I'll just tell you that. I'm more of an artsy kind of guy, all right? I, 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 like to, I like to draw. I like to play music and create music. I like to, I'm not really into poetry. I won't say that. But, uh, you know, that's some of us. I'm more of a language guy. Let's put it that way. I really excelled in English. We will say that. Um, but there is the laws of nature. All right, and we understand the laws of nature. What can you do about the laws of nature? Not a whole lot of anything, can you? Yeah, they are what they are. I had, uh, years ago, I had a meeting uh, downtown in Spokane. Actually, it was on the Lower South Hill. And I was trying to find a place to park. And it was in winter, middle of winter. <clears throat> and there's packed snow and ice on the ground, right? And you got all these side streets that, that are on the South Hill. If you've been on the South Hill, you know this. A lot of those streets are narrow and they're steep, all right? And I happened to pick one that day that I was trying to find a place to park on and it had packed snow and ice on it. And so I had driven to the top of this hill and I was looking for a, a place to park and all the way up the hill, 
on this side and all the way down the hill going that way, there, there were cars lined up. And if another car had come while I was driving down that hill, I don't know what we would have done because there was no room in there. And I'm looking for a place to park. And I, snot, I spotted right down towards the bottom of the hill, I spotted one open spot, but the problem was is that it was going up the hill and I was going down the hill. And so I said to myself, well, you're going to have, this logic, you're right, you know, you're going to have to go down the hill, turn around and come back up and get that spot. But nature had something else to say about that. You see, when I began to, to, to descend that hill, nature took over and my van that I was in decided that it did not want to drive in a straight line. And so what happened is it began to spin me around. And in my mind, you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking about insurance premiums. How many cars am I going to hit? You know, these are the kind of things that are going through my mind. How many of these, these cars will I pinball off before I actually, before I finally stop, right? And so I find myself now flipped completely around, and I'm still going down the hill, but this time I'm going backwards looking up the hill as I'm sliding down the hill, and I'm just waiting for some kind of impact, and all of a sudden, the most amazing thing happened. And if you don't believe in guardian angels, shame on you, because I do. My van went towards that side of the road where that parking spot was, and I kid you not, I slid the perfect parallel parking job here. I slid perfectly into that spot, never touching another car. And I'll tell you what, perfect amount of space everywhere. I was just sitting there amazed that this just happened. And I looked up, and there's this young lady walking down the street. She wasn't walking any longer because she had witnessed this whole thing. And her eyes were as big as saucers, and her jaw was dragging the sidewalk after she saw what had just happened to me. And I'll tell you what, I was very grateful, and I said, I got a guardian angel that's watching over me. And I'm sure that somebody was laughing somewhere out in the universe at that story. But it's true. There are laws, and there's nothing you can do about some of those things. But listen to this. I'm going to talk to you about two laws right now, and it was in our scripture today. You've got to understand these, and because this, this scripture is very misinterpreted by many people. And I'm going to give you an example in just a, in just a second here. Understand something. 1 John 3, 4 tells us this. Sin is a transgression of the law, all right? But this is what people who come to Christ, right? This is why he died for you because of sin. I want you to understand that as we go into this. Now listen, Romans 8, 2. For the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Now in your mind, you're thinking to yourself, all right, he's talking about laws here again. He's talking about laws. Uh -uh, you got to pay attention to what he's talking about here. One of the things about the Bible is that we have a book that is full of, of, it's indexed for us, right? It's all, it's all set out so that we can read it easily. It's got chapters and verses and books, and we, we can go easily to it. I just said Romans 8, 2, and boom, you can go right there. But these were not written this way. These were written in letter form. And so when you look at Romans, you say that Paul was writing a letter to the Romans. In order to understand what was written in Romans 8, you've got to read what was in Romans 7 and Romans 6, and all the way back. You see what I'm saying? You've got to read it in its context, because just because it's separated out in the mid-1500s, somebody decided to do this. Good idea, by the way. But it, it, in our minds, we have a tendency to do this. We read something, and we take it at face value, or what we think is face value, and then we leave it at that. Well, that's not the case. I want to tell you that is not the case with this scripture. You've got to read the chapter before to understand what he's talking about here. And so we're going to read it again. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. What law is that? I'm going to just tell you straight up what that's talking about. That is talking about the spiritual nature of Jesus Christ. It's talking about Christ's righteousness. It's made me free from the law of sin and death. Listen to what I'm going to say. Read here. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Jesus said the same thing over here in John chapter 8. We're going to read it over here, what Paul has to say about it in Romans chapter 8. If, if for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, we could say for the righteousness of Christ right there, for the spiritual nature that Christ gives us, this is what's going to set us free from the law of sin and death. Now, let's listen about this law and sin of, death, of sin and death here thing here. This is what people do, and I've seen them do it, and I'll give you an example here. 
People take that scripture and they say, aha, Jesus Christ died on the cross and he made me free from the law. And that's what they say. They stop right there. And I'm, I, I, I like to put on Facebook, I like to post scriptures, all right? I think it's an awesome witnessing tool. And you know, you'd be surprised the amount of people who you would not expect to like those scriptures. Ah, they're reading them. They are seeing them. And most of the time, the comments are very positive. Uh, I don't have, actually, I can't think of anybody who's ever said anything too negative on there. But I did post a scripture on there not too long ago, and I had somebody say something, and I wasn't surprised because I know the guy and I know where he's coming from. I don't agree with him, but I know where he's coming from because he's one of those people that believes that Jesus Christ died on the cross and not, therefore I'm not under the law anymore. I don't have to abide by the law anymore. And I'm not even exactly sure what that means, people, because it's like it's, it, I'm like way out in left field on understanding when people say that. And so he responded on my, my post because this is the scripture that I put on there. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. That's, that's all I put on there. And he wrote, sure glad I'm not under that law anymore. And I'm like, okay, all right. You don't understand what Paul's saying in Romans chapter 8 when you say that Jesus, by dying on the cross, freed me from God's spiritual law. Because, friends, that is not true. But that's not what that's saying anyway. That has nothing to do with that. Listen to what it says again. And I'm going to tell you what he's talking about. We're going to actually let Paul describe what he's talking about here, okay? So we've already said that the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is the, the, uh, the righteousness of Christ. We can just say it in simple terms that that's what it is. Let's listen to what the law of sin and death is. Let Paul explain what it is. But we've got to go back to chapter 7 to understand what he's talking about in chapter 8. Here we go. Verse, chapter 7, Romans, verses 22 and 23. I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So we know he's talking about the spiritual law right there. He had already mentioned that in, uh, in verse 714. But I see another law. So let's stop right there. He just said there's another law than the, God, the law of God. Isn't that what he just said? He's saying that there's another law here that's at war. That's what he's talking about here. It is warring against the law of my mind, and it is bringing me into captivity to the law of sin. Uh-oh, right there. He just said the law of sin is different than the law of God, didn't he? He's talking about two different things here. So if the, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus is representative as Christ's righteousness, his holy law, if that's what's being represented here, then the law of sin and death must just be the complete opposite. It has to be because Paul just said it. So then he says in verse 25, with my mind... I serve myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. He just spelled it out for us, people. He just said one of these is the spiritual nature of Christ, and the other is the fallen nature. That's what he's saying right here. The law of sin and death is the fallen nature. So let's read it again. The law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. If you know the truth, the truth shall set you free. If the Son, therefore, shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. He's talking here about it's only Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit that can come into my heart. That's what he's talking about here. And set me free from that old man of sin. That's what he's talking about here. You got to read the whole thing and you got to read it in context. Now, one of the things that he does is he talks in regards of marriage. He talks about marriage. And we, uh, we all, uh, uh, I think all of us here understand the rules of marriage, at least I hope we do, because, and, and he's under, he wants us to understand it in, in regards to a law, okay? So he's going to talk to us here in Romans chapter 7. He's going to talk to us in the first few verses here about marriage. But remember what we're talking about here. We're talking about the spirit of life, in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. We're talking about the old man of sin and the, in the restored spiritual image that Jesus Christ will give us, the spiritual nature. That's what he's talking about here. Don't forget that as we walk through this. So listen to what it says. Know ye not, brethren, for I speak to them that know the law, how that the law hath dominion over a man as long as he live. Now, we already just talked about that, right? The, the, the sting of sin is death, but the strength of sin is the law, right? It's telling us here it has dominion over us as long as we live. And why is that? 
Because it shows us what sin is. That's what he's talking about here. It shows us that the wages of sin is death. It tells us the penalty. He just said it again. All right? So now listen to what it says in verse 2, because he gets into this whole marriage thing. For the woman which has a husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as, she, as he liveth. But if the husband's dead, she is loose from the law of, of, um, of her husband. Now, I think anybody sitting in here would understand what that's talking about. It's saying that when you marry, you marry for life. That's what it's saying. And you understand that law. And you understand that the only way that you can be loosed from that law is through death. That's what he's saying. Now, don't base this on what society does, by the way, because society, I even see people in the church doing this, and I'm not pointing anybody out here or criticizing. I'm just telling you, I hear and see people in the church today that find every other reason to get out of a marriage other than what the Bible has said. And I want to tell you, there is no perfect marriage. There is no perfect situation, and everybody has trials that they have to go through. You got two different people coming together, right? And you got to make this life together, and you've got two different backgrounds, two different visions, two different things going on here, and somehow there's got to be a, a joining together of this. There has to be a working, a teamwork together to understand. And, and Paul, he's coming on this basis right here, that you understand that. He's not saying that just because somebody looks at you the wrong way, you can walk out the door. So we understand that there's a law that says that you are married until death occurs. That's what he's saying. All right, let's go to the next verse, verse 3. So then if, while her husband lives, she's married to another man, she'd be called an adulteress. But it, and he's, then he says it again. But if her husband's dead, she's free from that law, so she is no adulteress, though she be married to another man. And we understand that. I want you to look at this in a couple different ways. Notice that Paul's talking about women here as he refers to this. Do you notice this? He's talking about women. What in the Bible is represented as a woman? Either a pure church or an unfaithful church. That's what he, that, that's, that we got to look at this and we got to say. He is talking about you and I in this capacity as part of the church. We understand this law. And we know that as a church, you cannot serve two masters. You are married to one or you are married to the other. And if you claim you're married to one and you're hanging out with the other, then you are unfaithful. That's what it's telling us here because you cannot serve two masters. All right, we understand this now. But what is it that Paul's really trying to tell us here? Well, he's not telling us how to get rid of our spouse by any means. He's not talking about that. He just knows that you understand the law of marriage. That's what he's trying to tell us. In that, if you are married and in this union, a death has to occur to get out of it. So listen to what he says next in verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become, you also are become dead to the law, the old nature, by the body of Christ, the new nature, right? That you should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. What he's saying is, is that we as a church have a tendency to be married to that old nature, that law of sin and death. That's what we're married to. And until a death happens, you hear that? Until a death occurs, you cannot be married to Christ. That's what he's trying to tell us here. So we understand from this that a death has to occur. So we say, Okay, so what kind of death are we talking about? Well, remember when I was talking to you earlier, what did I start out with? Do you consider yourself held in bondage? You see what I'm saying? Are you held in bondage to that old nature? Let's read it again, Romans 8, 2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. This means that I have to understand some very important things. And here's one of the first things you got to remember. I told you I'm going to go back to Isaiah, Isaiah 52.3. We already read how we sold ourselves into iniquity because of what? Because of our sin. And that we are held in bondage by that nature, that fallen nature. Listen to what it says here. For thus says the Lord, you have sold yourselves for naught, and you shall be redeemed without money. Now, I want you to think about that for just a minute. How am I redeemed without money? 
Well, most of us, as we understand as Christians, call this grace, right? We understand that, remember the Adam and Eve thing I told you way back then? Yeah. Jesus said, he came and he said, you sinned, you have a fallen nature, you cannot, that nature cannot redeem you, it can't save you, and you cannot save yourself, but I am willing to stand in your place so that you can have this free gift of life eternal. And that way, even if you die on this earth, which most of us probably will, I, I, I gather that, that you can have life eternal if you decide that you want this, this spirit, this, this spirit, the gift of, Jesus, of life through Jesus Christ, if you want this in your life. But friends, a death has to occur. So what does it mean for a death to occur? So most of us understand, I mean, I, I, how many people don't, you know, kind of tear up a little bit when you see somebody get baptized? I mean, isn't that a beautiful thing? I watch baptism. I don't know why that, even more so than weddings. You know, a wedding, eh, you know, but baptisms, I like baptisms. I think that those are, those are pretty cool. And, and to see somebody who has committed themselves to Jesus Christ. But you have to understand something. When you look at baptism, you might look at it in kind of a three-step process here. And we understand that a person has decided to get baptized has already done what? They've already committed themselves. They've already surrendered. And, and if you haven't, then you need, to, you need to. Because baptism is simply a public demonstration of this. It's a way of, 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 of showing the world my commitment. It's a way of telling people that this is the, the path I've chosen. But we have already made that decision. So you look at this three-step process and you say, number one, when I step into the waters of baptism, I have done what? I have surrendered myself to Jesus Christ. And we understand step two is that when just as, as Jesus was crucified for us, you know, when Jesus died, and this is an amazing thing to think about, he became oblivious to the world. He became oblivious to everything around him. And we as Christians have to do this. It's a spiritual process. We have to, just as Jesus died, we have to be crucified with Christ, meaning that we have to be oblivious to the world as well. But how do we do that? In baptism, it's demonstrated, it's symbolically demonstrated as going down into the waters, into this death experience, but this is a surrender experience. This is me saying, I want the born-again experience, and I'm going, to, I'm going to forsake the world. I'm going to forget about the world. I'm going to become oblivious to that old nature because I want Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. I want him to come into my heart. And that's the third step, right? We raise out of the waters into the newness of life. And that newness of life is a sanctifying process. How are we sanctified? Through the word of God. I so many people, I have a sermon. I'll probably hit you with it here one of these days. And, and it's about the will of God. And, and it's this whole idea that, that we, we, we're always looking for the will of God in our lives, right? And it's right in front of us. It's right here. I mean, all you've got to do is pick this book up, and you can see what the will of God is, and he'll reveal it to you even more so when you do that. So we say, all right, if I'm going to become dead to sin, that means I'm going to become dead to this world. That means I'm going to surrender and give God the only thing that I can give him, and that is my will. That's what I'm going to do. And so every single day is a baptismal experience. This is what it comes down to. Every single day, I want to die to sin. I want to be crucified with Christ. I love this scripture. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. What is that faith in the Son of God? That is the belief that Jesus Christ came. He is the Messiah. He sacrificed everything for you. And because of that, I can go to him and I can ask for forgiveness and believe that he's forgiven me and that he will, by the power of his spirit, put his spirit within me. The presence of Jesus, the restored image of God, the spiritual nature. This is the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. That's what it's talking about. But I must die to this sin. I must choose, my friends. I must choose to follow Jesus. And once I choose to follow Jesus, you have a responsibility. And don't let, like my buddy on Facebook here, can try to convince you that, oh, you don't have anything to do anymore. You don't have to pay attention to those laws. I'm telling you, you'll have more work ahead of you than you ever imagined once you commit yourself fully to Jesus Christ because the devil knows it. 
And he's going to come after you with everything that he possibly can. But you have to say, no, I have surrendered daily through the power of the Holy Spirit. And I surrender myself to that, to Jesus Christ, through the power of the Spirit. I am going to be crucified daily. I'm going to go to Jesus. I'm going to fall on my knees and I'm going to ask forgiveness. And then I'm going to commit my ways to God. Don't trust in what you think. Don't trust in what you say. Don't trust in what other people say. Don't even trust in what I say. You go back through the word of God because it will sanctify you and it will raise you into the newness of life of Jesus Christ. And that's what we want. This is what we want. But friends, it comes with a price. And that death experience is a huge price because you're going to have to give up a lot of things that you never thought, never imagined that you'd have to give up. But friends, if you truly, truly want Jesus in your heart and in your life, then you will accept that. You will, you, will, you will just say, you know what? Every day, I'm going to surrender my will to Jesus Christ. I'm going to die daily, be crucified with Christ daily, and I'm going to move forward doing everything through the power that Christ puts within me to do what is right. There's a scripture here. Remember what it is. I will put my spirit within you, right? Remember what it says? I will take out the stony heart of flesh, the old nature. I will give you a heart of flesh, the new nature, but listen to the end. I will cause you, you hear that? I will cause you to walk in my statutes and keep my judgments. Friends, today's the day, and the asset of cost, it will come at a cost, but today's the day. There's no better day than the Sabbath, the sanctifying power of the Sabbath, which to enjoy this experience and have life through Jesus Christ. Amen.